The Denton Willow Pond Bridge, built of timber in 1878, was the only way over the Choptank River into the small town of Denton on Maryland's eastern shore. Over the years, it became a drawbridge of steel and concrete, 195 feet long and 24 feet wide. For almost a century, its span had borne the weight of all the traffic that rolled into and out of Denton from the west. Then came a day in March of 1976 when one car too many tried to cross the Willow Pond Bridge. driving across the bridge and heard this awful noise. I thought we'd been struck from behind. The car was bouncing up, in the, up and down in the air. And the wheels were over the hole, going like this, like a bucking bronco. And I turned around and looked behind us and said, Johnny, the bridge is falling in. And when we finally got stopped, we fell just two feet from the hole. Without warning, the bridge had failed. Luckily, there were only two people in the car and they were only slightly injured. But the damage could have been a lot worse. Just minutes before the collapse, 21 school buses had crossed the bridge, carrying hundreds of children and teenagers, and more were en route. A board of inquiry was quickly convened. Suspecting that some of the pilings had failed, the board sent timber samples to the Maryland State Highway Administration for analysis. At the state's Brooklynville laboratories, tests of the bridge pilings clearly demonstrated a loss of material strength in the timber pilings, a loss not detectable by the inspection techniques then being used. As a result of these tests, the Federal Highway Administration and the Maryland State Highway Administration entered into a contract with Dr. Sharif Agur of the Civil Engineering Department of the University of Maryland. The goal, to develop a new method for determining the in-place strength of timber pilings. Timber piles, because they are inexpensive to use and maintain, have long been a popular bridge support system. Because they are made of wood, however, bridge timbers will, over time, gradually deteriorate. The most common threats are abrasion, which can weaken pilings, and fire, which can destroy them. Less noticeable, but probably more dangerous, is the deterioration caused by bacteria and fungi. These microscopic organisms feed on the timber, devouring the heart of the piling and robbing it of density and strength. This unseen deterioration helped cause the collapse of the Denton Willow Pond Bridge dangerous and invisible. This kind of deterioration is not detectable by visual inspection. To protect pilings from these threats, bridge builders have traditionally tried two major approaches. The first technique is creosote. Saturating wood with creosote is usually effective in preventing biological decay. In warmer water, however, this technique is less effective, and it can fail altogether if the creosote has not penetrated deeply enough into the wood or has been scraped away by surface abrasion. A second approach designed to strengthen aging and damaged pilings is to encase them in protective jackets of metal, plastic, or concrete. These familiar methods, however, offer no guarantee against further weakening of timber pilings. So bridge supports have to be inspected periodically to make sure they are still capable of supporting the loads for which they have been rated. The traditional methods now widely used for inspecting bridge pilings, however, all have serious drawbacks. Visual inspection, for example, is the simplest the most popular and possibly the most flawed. Easy and inexpensive, 
visual inspection can only assess the surface of a piling. It tells us nothing about invisible damage that may lie beneath the surface. Sounding, another easily employed and inexpensive method, can tell us something more about internal damage. By tapping the piling with a hammer, the inspector can listen to the resonance of the tone and try to assess strength or weakness in the core of the piling. This method can only work, however, if the technician has an experienced ear. The most common way to inspect for internal decay is to probe the piling with an ice pick or knife. An easy penetration, or a hard one, can tell a technician the condition of the piling. A statistical sampling of the other piles in the structure can help him assess the overall strength of the bridge. There is one obvious drawback here. Probing the piling can damage the piling. In their laboratories, scientists have developed less destructive and much more accurate methods. Among them are radiography, magnetic resonancing, nuclear techniques, and X-ray techniques. While these sophisticated methods are more accurate, they usually require equipment that does not lend itself to field testing of pilings above and below the water line. One method, however, has proved highly accurate and versatile enough to use in the field. Originally developed in the laboratory to evaluate metals and concrete, ultrasonic technology is easily adaptable for testing timber pilings above and below the water line. In ultrasonic testing, Alternating stress waves are transmitted through the pile sections at low amplitudes. With undamaged timber, the wave transmission is quite rapid. With damaged and decayed timber, on the other hand, transmission is slowed down. By measuring the velocity of the ultrasonic wave transmission, scientists can determine the elasticity and strength of the tested material. The equipment used in ultrasonic testing includes a digital readout V-meter, Two transducers with a frequency of 54 kilohertz connected by coaxial cables. One transducer serves as a transmitter, the other a receiver. A reference bar. A power supply that is either an internal battery or a 115 volt generator. And a high viscosity coupling. The high vacuum grease acts as a coupling to provide air-free contact between the surfaces of the transducers and the piling. A generated ultrasonic pulse is sent by the transmitter through the test piece to the other side, where the receiver picks up the pulse and displays the transit time on the digital readout. To determine the distance between transducers on a circular piling, a technician has two options. He can use a tape measure and the mathematical equation diameter equals circumference divided by pi. Or he can use the special framework that carries a printed scale for the direct measurement of the distance above or below water. Once the time and distance of the ultrasonic pulses have been measured, the velocity can be determined by using this mathematical formula where Vn equals wave propagation velocity in feet per second. D equals path length in inches. And T equals transit time from the V-meter in seconds. In conducting their research, the University of Maryland investigators tested a large number of old, treated southern yellow pine piles from 11 different bridges in the state. Their research developed a relationship between the wave velocity, compressive strength of the piles, and unit weight, a relationship that will enable engineers to determine in-place pile strength. For efficient use in the field, the ultrasonic method requires some advanced planning to help reduce confusion and costly delay. The first step is a pre-inspection survey by an inspector familiar with the ultrasonic method. To determine the best way to conduct the inspection, he needs to know the physical layout of the pilings, including the type of bracing between the piles, the clearance between the water level and the top of the piles, and 
the depth of submergence. These details are all important in determining whether to conduct the test from the top of the bridge or whether to use a boat and a scuba diver. The next step is to identify the piles, mark them, and note their conditions. The technician then plans which piles are to be tested and in what order. If any of the piles to be tested have abundant growth buildup, it will be necessary to clean them before the inspection can be carried out. The actual inspection of pilings above the waterline requires one trained technician and an assistant. The technician should be familiar with the conditions under which decay usually exists and be able to spot its visual characteristics. The first step is to use the brush to clean the surfaces of those piles scheduled to be tested. And the next step is to calibrate the V-meter. To accomplish this, cover the faces of the transducers with the couplant and place one at each end of the reference bar. When the digital readout meter gives the constant reading that is engraved on the bar, calibration is complete. Next, take the transducers, now covered with coupland, and position them firmly on the pile to be tested. It is very important to place the transducers opposite each other and keep them in firm contact with the surface of the piling. It might also be necessary to reposition the transducers up or down to obtain the minimum time readings. At this point, start generating the ultrasonic pulses. Then, choose the most appropriate time scale for reading the time display. Once the scale is determined, begin the test and record the transit time on the ultrasonic testing data form. To measure and record pulse path length, use either a tape measure or the scale on the framework. Then rotate the two transducers diametrically around the section for another reading, taking two to three different readings at each level. Use either the average or the lowest transit time for computing the wave velocity. Be sure to also note the distance of these readings from the top of the piling and enter this information on the form. This same procedure is repeated at previously determined intervals down the length of the piling to the surface of the water. If the water is more than three feet deep, one of the technicians has to be a trained diver who can do underwater inspections. Local regulations may require additional personnel to ensure safe operation. To guard against moisture damage, be sure to cover the transducers with a watertight sealant, such as RTV silicon rubber. Special underwater transducers are also available. If the pilings cannot be inspected from the top of the bridge, arrange for the use of a boat. Once again, begin by cleaning the pile surface of any marine growth that has built up. A rope attached to the diver's wrist can provide simple communication between the technician in the boat and the divers down below. If more sophisticated communications are needed, arrange for an underwater intercom system. To start the inspection, the diver submerges and puts the transducers in place. There is no need to use a couplant with the transducers underwater, since water itself is an excellent couplant. When the technician in the boat has taken a transit time reading, he pulls the rope, and the diver moves down to the next level, and so on. At the bottom, the diver rotates the transducer 90 degrees and begins to work his way up the pile in the same increments. Once the technician has the readings, he can determine the velocity of the ultrasonic waves through the tested sections. The approximate condition of the pile tested can be gauged from this table. This data is derived from tests of dry, treated southern yellow pine, the most commonly used timber piling in Maryland. A pile with a velocity of 5,500 feet per second or higher is in excellent condition. One with less than 3,000 feet per second is probably in poor condition. Since these relationships are only an estimate, they should be used with caution. It is necessary to also establish the unit weight in order to determine the compressive strength of a piling. The most accurate way is to weigh the section 
measuring its volume and calculating its density at the specified moisture content. For piles in service, this is obviously not possible. Instead, a convenient method is to weigh small cores bored out from the pile. When it is not possible to determine the average unit weight of a pile, it is still possible to determine an approximate value for the unit weight from knowledge of the wave velocity. Naturally, the use of such approximate relationships will reduce the accuracy of the estimate. Once the unit weight is known, the compressive strength of a piling can be predicted by a series of formulas developed as a result of the University of Maryland tests. For new treated sections, the formula is sigma crushing equals 0 0.535 Vn plus 41.35 gamma. Where sigma crushing is the average compressive strength in pounds per square inch, Vn is the wave velocity in feet per second, and gamma is the in-place unit weight in pounds per cubic foot. For example, if a pile section has a transit time reading on the V-meter of 166 microseconds and a material density of 40 pounds per cubic foot and a diameter of 12 inches, the compressive strength can be calculated in two steps. First, using the velocity formula, Vn equals d over t times 1 over 12 feet per second. The velocity is calculated to be 6,024 feet per second. When the velocity is plugged into the formula for compressive strength, the results are calculated to be 4,877 psi. Other formulas have been developed for a range of conditions above and below the waterline. To determine the loss of strength that may have occurred in an in-place pile, you must know the original strength of the pile. The average values of most wood used for pilings have been published by the American Society of Testing Materials. These figures provide a reasonably good basis for comparison. In using the ultrasonic testing method, bear in mind the following considerations to get reliable results. Remember that the data bank resulting from the University of Maryland tests and the equations derived for dealing with compressive strength were based on work carried out mostly on southern yellow pine, the main kind of wood used for timber piles in Maryland. If the pile to be tested is a different or unknown species of timber, then it is also necessary to test a section of the timber that is in good condition. This reading can then be compared with readings from the rest of the piles to be tested to estimate their relative condition. The method is valid in fresh water and in most marine environments. At certain degrees of salinity and temperature, however, pilings are subject to attack by marine borers that cause a loss in the cross-sectional area of the timber pile. If the inspector knows they have marine borers or is not sure, he must use caution in interpreting the readings obtained. For additional information on this method of ultrasonic testing, consult the published research reports. Or send for a copy of the Operations and Analysis Manual, Inspection of Bridge Timber Piling, available from the Federal Highway Administration's Office of Implementation in McLean, Virginia. In every state, every county, every city, there are bridges like Denton Willow Pond Bridge, aging bridges that could one day collapse, injuring or perhaps killing people with little or no warning. Ultrasonic testing, however, can give us the early warning we need to help prevent dangerous bridge failures. This kind of inspection is both accurate and inexpensive. For ultrasonic testing, the cost of the apparatus is only about $6,000. A small price to pay for saving so many bridges and so many lives.